As a Kempo practitioner, one of the misconceptions I hear the most is, Kempo won't work in MMA. You want to bet? Today, we have special guest master John Halkelman, founder and grandmaster of his Hawaiian Kempo system and one of the most notable MMA coaches and contenders in the sport. Let's go talk to him and see what he has to say. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about um, a little bit more of the MMA themed. Um, and I yeah. figured let's go ahead and let's ruffle some feathers here. One of the comments I hear a lot from, from people is, oh, Kempo will never work in the ring or in the UFC. What is your answer to that comment? It's, it's an incomplete comment because, uh, because Kempo, you know, whether you spell it with an N or an M, um, most Kempo systems – that haven't evolved, they wouldn't do well. If you're doing katas, um, you're not going to do well in MMA. Y yeah, you're just uh, you're just not. You, so now people argue. Here's the biggest two arguments: uh, Machida, Leota Machida, and um, Stephen Wonderboy. Right? They like to do katas. Right? They grew up at at three years old doing karate already because they they were born. Both of them were born into uh, karate school owners. You know, they're they're they born to them. So they also have eight to sixteen hours a day every single day to do kata and do their and do their MMA stuff. So instead of two hours a week, like the average student goes twice a week. Your average two hours that's two hours a week. Your average. Steve Wonderboy and, and Leo Machida, they've probably been at the, their gym 12 hours a day, six days a week. So they have a lot of time to do that. If you only have two hours a week, there's no time for a kata. That's right. And you're not going to be an MMA guy. I mean, you can't train to be an MMA guy, you know, with that, with that kind of schedule. So it wouldn't work for Taekwondo or Shotokan or any other style. Um, now the same thing holds true for jujitsu. If you did two hours a week and you just did jujitsu, you wouldn't you wouldn't do well in MMA. No, I like I want to draw back to what you said before because uh, previously you said that it didn't matter what art you train in if you don't put that condition in there, you don't put that fuel in the tank, and it doesn't matter what the system is, you're just not going to do well because that effort isn't there. So, so basically, um, to quote Top Gun Maverick, it's not the plane but the pilot in the box, basically. For that, yeah. For that, for the for the conditioning part, yes. For the conditioning part, without a doubt. But you know, a lot of other things go into it. But nothing can come out of it unless there's conditioning. You know, it, but without without anything else, you still have a chance of winning. So, like, if you have no wrestling and no jujitsu, no grappling, but just striking, you could still win. If you only had grappling. Right. And no wrestling and no striking. You can still win. If you don't have conditioning, you'll never win. Hey, Dojo fans. We are excited to share our new Colors of Combat t-shirt collection with all of you. Now, we love this channel and we love our community and we want to keep producing content, but we do need help. So instead of getting sponsors for VPNs or Shadow Warrior Legend Battle League games or novel manscaping products, we felt we wanted to offer you something a little bit better. This new collection features 22 designs of multiple martial arts and explosive colorful displays so that you can represent your art and style. We really appreciate all of you, and if you use the code COLOR2023, you can get 10% off of each purchase until the end of June. Now, this code is good for both this collection as well as our previous Forefather series. Oh, and also, if you send us pictures of you in your shirts, we'll share them to our social media feeds. Thank you all so much for your support, and now back to the video. Are there any particular techniques or aspects of training from your, your earlier Kempo days and Kaju Kempo days that you've brought into your MMA teaching? Oh, a, a lot. Yeah, a lot. Um, a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. Probably too much to name. The, but the things I took out were a lot, too. I probably took out more stuff than I put in or just as much. So from your days competing and now going over to training your MMA fighters, do you train them and teach them differently than the way you trained yourself? Uh, any, was there any evolution in that? Or, or do you pretty much oh, teach yeah. them the same way? Uh, there's a lot of similarities, but even more differences. I evolved a lot. 
uh, training has evolved a lot. Um, my my um, my uh, philosophy and concepts have changed a lot. But I bring in some stuff, you know, like the mental toughness and and uh, the fun part. My I've always had fun coaches, and you know, I've, you know we've joked around a lot, and and I've had fun t- teammates, you know. So I've kept some things. I've done both. I've kept come. I've kept some things the way they were, like back in the day, and then I've evolved a lot. Maybe the spine. The spine is the biggest thing I've evolved. You know, I. I I don't even remember the last time I had my guys just sparring full on when that was every day from my entire career. And mo- a huge part of the time, my fighters, it was, they were going hard every time. Now we, we, I don't even remember the last time, you know, my guys went hard and sparring to the face um, or grappling really hard. Um, we don't do that anymore. So we've evolved that, you know, tremendously and then conditioning is it's 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 changed a little but um pretty much we've always been known for a hard hardcore in our training both my hawaiian kempo and my um and my sport you know my mma or my kickboxing or whatever uh we we push the conditioning like no other gym i know is your cross pit program uh, separate from your your training program, or are they integrated together? The CrossFit is is the fourth thing. You know, we have striking, grappling, wrestling, and CrossFit. So it's our conditioning. Pro- that is our conditioning program. So I like how you're talking about um, the effort was there to kind of create a hybrid between the striking and the jujitsu stuff. Uh, when you have a new student come in that has, has prior experience and they're interested in becoming a fighter, do you try to incorporate as much of their previous experience as possible or do you try to break them away and kind of conform to kind of a new way of thinking? It depends. Like he comes over with all this experience. I don't know. Is he coming over with a lot of skill too? So if he's, if their skill is, is, is grappling heavy, you know, everything else that he's doing, he's going to learn everything else, but he's going to focus on his wrestling, focus on his strength, you know, build, you know, so you, you want to work on your weaknesses, but you want to focus on your strength. What's the weirdest or most unexpected technique that you've seen work in a real match? Uh, it was, uh, it was a weird up kick while the guy was, the girl was standing, it was a girl, I think. And she was standing on another girl, and the girl gave her a liver kick from her guard, and it was it was probably the weirdest. That was probably one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. I've seen crazy shit over the last fifty plus years, but that was probably the weirdest uh, one of the weirdest techniques I've ever seen work. So we've seen MMA evolve over the past couple decades. I mean, even just from the nineties yeah. to what it is today, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, what do you see for the future of the sport? And do you think that there's ever going to be a particular blend of MMA that will become its own art, almost like a new Kaju Kempo? I think it's the opposite. It went, it went the other way already. You know, like I don't think a sport is going to turn into a street art. It's just, people are always going to have those techniques and they're always going to, you know, it's going to be, um, I think martial arts schools like that are, that are partial arts schools and they don't teach, you don't teach, uh, you know, all the other factions of the art. Like, if they don't teach takedown defense and it's a striking school, then it's it's not going anywhere. It shouldn't even, you know, it's it's terrible. You know, it's, it's you're taking people's money unless you're teaching them and saying this is for sport only. Like, you go to a BJJ school, they're saying, you know, hey, this is for sport. You know, so they're they're training them for the sport. You know, boxing gym they they train them for the sport, right? I think each martial artist is going to start saying, you know, hey, I gotta, you know, I gotta evolve because I want to stay a relevant, you know, school and not be a McDojo. Then I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to learn this, this, and this. So, you know, I think they're going to keep their name, just like you know, just yeah. But I think they're going to, you know. Pretty soon, it's just all going to be one, you know. So it's just going to be the name of the the individual name, because everything else, gonna be, everything being taught, is going to be the same. It has to be. So I don't know, that's what I think. I think I think it's the opposite. But I don't think the MMA sport will turn into a 
martial art. It is a martial art already, you know. It's a mixed martial art, and they call it MMA, just like Kajukempo or, or you know, whatever else, Valley Tudo or, um, you know, shoot boxing or, you know, whatever. Um, it's, just, it's just a label and a name. But all martial arts should should teach the four, you know, the four blocks or else they, they're, you know, then they, or else they're, they're just a sport, you know. So for somebody who um, is watching this video and they're considering a career in MMA or they want to go into competitive fighting, what would be the number one key takeaway message that you'd like them to leave this video with? I would try to, number one, see, I mean, if you're really serious and you want to do it, you know, and you're willing to sacrifice you should find an MMA facility, you know, and a, an MMA gym. Like, say you live in, you know, Florida, depends on where. You would live near Coconut Creek. You go to ATT. You go, there's there's MMA fight gyms all over right now, and there's a hell of a lot in Florida. But um, that's what you should do. And if you couldn't do that because you live in wherever, like bum, bumfuck wherever, um and you don't they don't they don't have an MMA gym, then you should try to put a striking gym with a grappling gym and a, and a wrestling gym and go get a CrossFit, you know, start training some CrossFit. So if you could have a dream sparring match with anybody, whether it's a fictional person or a real life person, living or dead, who would your dream sparring match be and why? Dream sparring match. Um I I to like the best the guy that I think is the best striker ever the best kickboxer ever um benny the jet utilities um and i i got to spar with him more than once so i i can't think of anyone that i think is the better striker ever you know, ever since you know ever so it's funny that you i, I like that you mentioned uh, benny the jet because um a lot of people i ask that question to you they say that that they wish they could but i find it interesting that you actually did so that's a pretty unique experience that you have that a lot of people don't have oh yeah and he trained me for probably 20 of my pro fights yeah so i got yeah i had a lot i've had a lot of dealings with uh benny the jet and uh we fought on the same card when i was 16 um we sparred together when I was 16. Unfortunately, it didn't end well. For, it didn't end well for me at all. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really close with him in a lot of ways, and he's my he's who I think is the best um, uh, mar martial artist ever. I think probably best martial. I, I, if I had to pick one person, it would be him. Do you have a favorite unspoken rule in the martial arts? Yeah, there's two. Number one is always hit first. No, always hit first, and it's better to, you know, have to you know get forgiveness than end up in a fucking nursing home with a tracheostomy and a coma. So I would always say hit first, and then a kind of one that at the gym, it's hit as hard sparring, hit as hard as you want to get hit. I like that one. That one I, I like. Um, I believe in that one as well too, because you kind of feed you feed off your partner, so like you can kind of give as good as they get. There's there's that, almost like a communication, nonverbal communication there. Yeah, yeah. And there's some guys have absolutely no control, and some guys have a lot of control. They're just fucking bullies, so they go harder when they go with a you know lighter guy or a or a lesser guy. And some people just have no control. They swing wild uh, against Chuck or or. You know, someone that doesn't know anything. They just have no control. But that's when the instructor comes in. But the majority of the people, they will control it. I give them percentages. Like like when they're sparring, I go from the leg to the body to their head. So I'll say, you know, 7% to the legs, 88% to the body, and seven or 2% to the head. And that's the power, the percentage of power I want. Um, and the final question is, um, is there anything that you wish people would ask you that they never do? Well, I could say, I could tell you one. I wish they would stop asking me. I, are, are you Chuck Liddell's dad? <laughs> yeah. If people could fucking stop asking me that, I'd be really happy. You know, that's, that's the guy. That he's like, he's nine years younger than me. Nine years. So no, I'm not his dad. You asshole. Anyway. <laughs> Or teasing. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs>
I would like to thank you for sharing your experience with MMA because a lot of people don't always get that side of the perspective unless they're in it. So it was very interesting to hear um, you coming from your art background and into the, you, I mean, you, you trained in the martial arts and you actually fought on the street, you fought in the ring. So you have a unique experience. So I just want to thank you for sharing with us that today because it's a perspective most of us don't have. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm, I'm thank you guys for putting it out there. Thank you again to Mr. Halkerman for sharing his experience with us. It's quite easy to criticize and judge, but I place heavy value on the opinions of those who have actually walked that path. Now, there's a lot more to Hawaiian Kempo than what we covered today, and it's important to know its roots. Now, Mr. Hackman spent some time talking with us about his establishment of Hawaiian Kempo, where it came from, how he started, and tells us exactly what Hawaiian Kempo is.